This episode of Messed Up Origins is sponsored by Raycon. Ahoy Solo fam, my name is John Solo, and I don't know about you, but I'm starting to get a little stir crazy here in quarantine. Now don't get me wrong, before all this COVID craziness hit, I was basically the old man in Zelda who gives you the sword. I'm comfortable here in my little cave and don't like to leave if I don't have to. Now that being said, every once in a while I start to feel more like Link, and after more than a month of being stuck inside, I'm starting to get the hankering for some adventure. Sadly, I have to be a responsible citizen. I have to do my part by staying inside, and so do you. Now's when I start to buy my Halloween stuff. What am I not supposed to buy my Halloween stuff? Really? Well, he does make a good point, but still. The silver lining is that while our bodies have to remain isolated, our minds can wander, which is why today we're talking about the seven voyages of Sinbad the Sailor. I figured we could live vicariously through him. Now, before I started the research process, I actually didn't know that much about Sinbad. In fact, the only thing I knew him from outside of the Arabian Nights collection was the movie they made about him back in 2003 starring Brad Pitt. And I didn't even see it, though it doesn't seem like I missed much. As it turns out though, Sinbad's made appearances in all kinds of media. Not only have authors throughout the centuries written books where they put their own personal twist on his adventures, he's been in Marvel comics, they've made live action movies about him, and he's been featured or referenced in old cartoons like Popeye. He may not be at the forefront of culture today, but Sinbad has definitely got some clout with storytellers around the world, and after reading his story, it's easy to see why. Not only are his seven voyages thrilling to read about and full of that gory goodness that we humans pretend not to be enamored by, but like many stories written around this time, it contains a powerful archetypal message about the importance of going out out into the world and making a name for yourself. I'm eager as hell to dive into the story and I hope you are too, so let's not delay it any longer. As always, make sure you both like and subscribe to have more messed up content like this delivered to your sub box every week. And now without further ado, the very messed up origins of Sinbad. So a brief overview before we get started. Sinbad is known nowadays as one of the three most famous stories found in a collection of stories called the 1001 Nights, or as we know it here in America, 1001 Arabian Nights. Experts believe the collection was first created with already existing Indian and Persian stories around 700 AD and was repeatedly added to over the course of the Islamic Golden Age until roughly 1400. Like many collections written back then, the Arabian Nights has a frame story, meaning there's an overarching narrative through which the tales are being told. If follows a Persian king who has his wife executed when he finds out she cheated on him and then goes on to marry a new woman every night. You know, to cope with the loss. The really messed up part though is that he has each of his new wives executed the morning after they get married. That is, until he meets a pretty young thing named Scheherazade. On their wedding night, his new bride starts telling the king an exciting story, but she doesn't finish it. And he gets so invested that when the sun comes up, he delays her execution until the next day so he can hear the rest. You can probably see where this is going already. Scheherazade continues telling stories and ending on cliffhangers so the king won't want to kill her yet, and this goes on for 1,001 nights until he falls in love and marries her. So cute, right? The ironic thing, though, is that none of its three most famous tales, Sinbad, Aladdin and the Wonderful Lamp, or Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves, were included until 300 years after the collection was done being altered, when a French translator named Antoine Galland added them to his own translation of the nights after hearing them from a Syrian storyteller in 1704. That doesn't mean those stories aren't just as ancient as the others in the collection, though. As you're about to see, Sinbad in particular particular is heavily inspired by Homeric epics like the Odyssey, written way back in the 8th century BCE, and is similar to another tale that was first discovered in ancient Egypt. The specific rendition we're covering today was written by British explorer Richard Burton in 1885. And yes, this man was just as badass as he looks. According to Wikipedia, some of his best known achievements are a well-documented journey to Mecca while in disguise, back when Europeans were forbidden access under penalty of death. He was one of the first two Europeans to visit the Great Lakes of Africa in search of the source of the Nile, he wrote a translation of the Kama Sutra in English, and an uncensored translation of 1001 Nights. So yeah, you guys are in for a treat. Okay, so remember how we talked about the Arabian Nights frame story? Well, Sinbad has a frame story too. I know, it's a little redundant, but this one allows us to extract some archetypal significance out of the tale, so it gets a pass. It opens by introducing us to a lowly porter living in a little city called Baghdad. Maybe you've heard of it. A porter, for those who don't know, is someone who's paid to transport goods around the city, and this particular porter is exhausted from working in the blazing sun all day. He sits down to rest on a bench in front of a rather elegant mansion and complains to Allah about the injustice of a world that allows the rich to rest in comfort 
comfort while the broke bitches gotta work all day long only to remain broke bitches. Well, the merchant who owns the mansion he's sitting in front of overhears his cries and calls him over to introduce himself. It turns out they're both named Sinbad. So now we have Sinbad the Porter and Sinbad the Seaman. You can see right here why we needed last names and how we got them. So Sinbad Seaman, who I'm gonna choose to call Sinbad Sailor, tells Sinbad Porter the way he became rich was through fortune and fate over the course of seven incredible voyages and then begins to share them. Now before Sinbad became Sinbad the Sailor, he was known as Sinbad the Trust Fund Baby. His father was extremely wealthy and when he died, he left everything he owned to Sinbad. So for the next several years, he lived a life of luxury. He had the fanciest food, the most delicious clothes, and more concubines than Dan Bilzerian. But one day he woke up to realize that most of his wealth had been squandered. My man didn't sit and wallow in self-pity though. He got motivated and decided to follow in his daddy's footsteps. He sold the rest of what he owned, bought some gear for his adventure, and left on a boat full of merchants to sell goods in strange lands. Only things don't go exactly as planned. See, after a long day of selling, the merchants end up making a stop on a deserted island to set up camp for the night. Or at least that's what they thought. It turned out the island they were camping on wasn't an island at all, but instead a massive sea monster called the Aspidocalone. This terrifying creature sits stationary in the ocean so that sailors dock their ships on it, then it moves, pulling them into the ocean and drowning them. Just imagine how scary that shit would be. You're laying in bed after a long day of work, you're right on the cusp of falling asleep, then you're 20 feet underwater with salt in your eyes. No thanks. Well, that's exactly what happened to Sinbad. He was pulled underwater, the ship left without him, and he had to cling to a floating wooden tub to survive. We skip ahead to the next day when Sinbad wakes up on the shore of what he prays to Allah is not another living creature. He's badly injured, but uses some of the fruit and other natural resources on the island to nurse himself back to health. And after gaining the strength to explore a bit, he runs into another lone wanderer. After Sinbad tells the story of how he ended up there, the stranger tells his own backstory. He's apparently one of the caretakers of the king of the island horses and is responsible for mating them with seahorses. That is full-sized horses that live in the sea, not the itty bitty ones where the guys get pregnant instead of the girls. Well, Sinbad helps him out with this strange task and is then taken to meet the king who gives him a very warm welcome after hearing about his miraculous survival of the Aspidocalone. Sinbad goes on to gain the trust of the king, is named his official royal advisor, and things are all good in the hood for a while. But after an undisclosed amount of time, the very ship that left Sinbad to die pulls into the king's port. Our man approaches them and is all like, yo, I'm Sinbad, remember me? And they say, we know a Sinbad, but we don't know if you're him. Fortunately though, my man has level 10 charisma, so he does manage to convince them that he's the real deal, then they return all of his old possessions, which they had in safekeeping. He then uses those possessions to make the king of the island a gift, the king returns the favor tenfold, Sinbad sells the rest of his wares for cash, and travels back home even more wealthy than when he left. Now it's at this point the story of the first voyage ends, and we're brought back to the frame story, which, just a heads up, actually ends the same way as the next five chapters. Sinbad Sinbad Sailor tells Sinbad Porter to eat dinner with him and his friends, tips him 100 dinar for his time, and tells him to come back tomorrow to hear more about his adventures. And speaking of, let's move on to Sinbad's second voyage, shall we? After the insanity that was his first voyage, you might think Sinbad would take it easy for a while, but it wasn't long before he started jonesing for another adventure. So once again, he boards a fancy ship full of merchants. Once again, they travel to distant lands. And once again, he's left behind. This time because he took a nap too far away from camp and his mates thought he drowned. Left with no other choice, Sinbad wanders aimlessly around the island until he stumbles upon a rock's nest. And for those who don't know, a rock is a massive bird in Middle Eastern mythology that preys on elephants. Some of you may remember from back in the up origins of Aladdin that the original genie's master was actually a rock, a detail the live action movie may have been referencing when Jafar transformed Iago into a rock during the chase scene. Well, Sinbad realizes that the mama rock may be his ticket off the island, so he ties his turban around her legs when she's sleeping, and then when the morning comes, she takes flight. So Sinbad's plan does kind of work. The rock does carry him somewhere else, but sadly, somewhere else is a valley full of giant snakes. After detaching himself from mama rock, Sinbad notices the floor of that valley is covered in diamonds. Then he he remembers the methods the old merchants used to harvest the precious gems without being eaten by the aforementioned giant snakes. They would throw chunks of fresh meat into the valley so the loose diamonds would stick to the blood. Then they would wait for the birds to scoop the meat and take it back to their nest where more people would be waiting to scare the birds away and take the diamonds off the meat after they dropped it. Yeah, that's an incredibly specific method that he just so happened to hear about before the adventure. It's about a deviation away from being a deus ex machina, but we'll let it slide on account of it being written over a thousand years ago. So Sinbad notices there's 
already chunks of meat in the valley, and figuring he's about to die anyway, runs down himself to harvest the diamonds, but he ends up being picked up by the rock when it goes to grab some meat. The rock then carries him back to its nest, but lo and behold, the merchants who toss the meat are waiting there to harvest the diamonds, and they scared her away, causing her to drop Sinbad. At first, the merchants were bummed to see the meat didn't have any diamonds on it, but then Sinbad jumped up and was like, hey, I actually caught those and more catch and split his loot with them. Then our hero, if you want to call him that, tells his new friends about his adventures so far and they all journeyed back home to Baghdad. Now this third voyage is where I think the inspiration from the Odyssey is the most apparent because spoiler alert, Sinbad has a run-in with a giant that is very similar to Odysseus's run-in with Polyphemos. The way he ends up shipwrecked is a little different from his last two voyages though. This time the winds actually took his ship off course to an uncharted island where it was then torn apart by savage apes. It's when Sinbad and the survivors are wandering around the island that they discover a castle to set up camp in. But while they're napping, because if there's any moral to the story so far, it's don't ever take naps, the castle's owner returns. The men all wake up to the roars of the giant and see him standing over them, which, based on the author's description of the monster, I have to imagine made them all shit their pants simultaneously. Then there came down upon us from the top of the castle a huge creature in the likeness of a man, black of color, tall and big of bulk as he were a great date tree, with eyes like coals of fire and eye teeth like boar's tusks, and a vast big gape like the mouth of a well. Moreover, he had long loose lips like camels, hanging down upon his breast, and ears like two jarms falling over his shoulder blades and the nails of his hands were like the claws of a lion. Yeah, I definitely shit my pants. You might think the giant would go on a rampage here, killing and eating all of the trespassers, but it chose to eat only the captain for his first meal because he was a big old fat boy, meaning he was both filling and delicious. The book then goes into far more detail than necessary, describing how the giant cooks him. It says he breaks his neck, shoves a giant stick up his ass and through his forehead before cooking his twitching body rotisserie style. Then it proceeds to tear him apart limb from limb and eat him like humans do a chicken until only his bones Bones were left. Wait, did I go into too much detail too? Well anyway, after eating Captain Big Boy, the giant passes out, but for some reason the merchants don't try sneaking away. Instead, they wait until the next morning when the giant leaves and Sinbad formulates a plan. They decide they're gonna take the red hot irons the giant uses for cooking and stab him in the eyes with them while he's sleeping, then ride away on a makeshift boat they made with the leftover parts from their ship. So as you can see, it's pretty similar to Odysseus's plan to blind Polyphemos. Only in that story, they wait until he's drunk to do it instead of in a food coma. You'll be happy to hear that Sinbad's plan goes about perfect too. That is until the blinded giant calls his friends and they all start throwing boulders at the perpetrators. The only ones to survive the retaliation are Sinbad and two other merchants and those two end up being killed not long after when their boat lands on an island of giant snakes. Fortunately though, Sinbad not only survives Snake Island but also finds a way to flag down a passing ship to pick him up. And you're not going to believe this but the ship that scoops him is the same ship that abandoned him on his last adventure after they thought he drowned. They end up apologizing to Sinbad for the confusion. They give back his old possessions. He sells them to the next few islands they travel to, and eventually he makes his way back home. So in my humble opinion, Sinbad's fourth voyage is both the darkest and the most hilarious. That's because this time, after he and his crew are shipwrecked, they end up on an island inhabited by a tribe of cannibals that they don't realize are cannibals until it's too late. See, the cannibals, or as the book calls them savages, invited Sinbad and his crew to their village for a feast and then secretly drugged them so they'd have a ravenous appetite and then fatten themselves up to be eaten later. Richard Burton theorizes the specific drug they gave them was an herb called Bang, a form of edible cannabis native to India. So yeah, yeah, these savages pulled in Uncle Joey and gave the crew edibles without them realizing it. Which actually reminds me of the part in the Odyssey where Odysseus's men fall under a spell after eating the lotus plant and don't want to go home. So I wonder if they're connected. Well, fortunately, Sinbad didn't eat the herbs, so he was fine, and then he made a quick getaway to a nearby city where, before long, he befriends the king and is married to a beautiful lady. Yeah, apparently Sinbad was incredible at networking. The problem is, only a short time later, Sinbad's wife falls sick and dies. And it's at this point he learns about the city's custom of burying both a husband and the wife when one of them dies. I know, it's a pretty stupid tradition, and Sinbad tries to tell them that too, but they disregard his pleas for reason and lower him into the same cavern as his wife's corpse, along with about a week's worth of rations. Our hero then spends the next week sipping water and nibbling on bread while surrounded by the corpses of the city's lost lovers when the cavern is suddenly opened and a woman and her dead husband is lowered down. You might think this is where Sinbad makes his escape, but nah. Instead, he gets himself more rations by sneaking up behind his new cellmate and bashing her head in with somebody's leg bone. 
I know, that seems pretty heartless, but people do some crazy shit to survive. And what's even wilder is that Sinbad continues to bash in the heads of everyone who gets lowered into the chamber for the next several weeks. He does eventually find his way out though, and it's actually similar to how the Resistance escaped the caves in episode 8. He found an animal that had made its way into the cavern and followed it down a long tunnel to find a hidden exit out the back. Funnily enough, after making his way out of the cave, Sinbad actually went back in to steal all the valuables that people were buried with. Yes, this is the character we're supposed to root for. Then he flagged down yet another passing ship because at this point he was getting pretty good at it and sailed with his new friends back home. I maintain that Sinbad's fourth voyage is the darkest of them all, but his fifth voyage has to be the strangest. This time around, he ends up shipwrecked because the geniuses on his boat catch sight of a giant egg sitting on a nearby island, so they dock, break it open, slit the throat of the baby bird that's inside, and eat it. Somehow none of them stop to point out that if the premature baby is bigger than you are as a fully grown adult, then maybe it's a bad idea to piss its parents off. When mom and papa bird, which happened to be rocks, returned to their nest to find their baby had been eaten, they flew into a rage, pun intended, and destroyed Sinbad's ship with boulders as they tried to escape. A few hours later, Sinbad wakes up on the shore of another island that's dense with forest and fruit, and a mysterious old man he doesn't recognize is sitting there too. Thinking it might be another merchant from the ship, Sinbad approaches him, and the stranger asks to be carried somewhere on his shoulders. Sinbad wanted to be a good dude, so he said yes, but as it turns out, this was no mere stranger, rather a mythological figure known as the Old Man of the Sea. Typically, this old man is actually a water god in disguise, someone like Nereus, Proteus, or Triton, but but his identity is never made clear in this story. So Sinbad carries the old man to his requested spot, but instead of getting off, he tightens his legs around Sinbad's neck, beats on his chest and back like an angry chimpanzee, and orders him to carry him around from place to place all day long until he's completely exhausted and prays for death. It was a horrible punishment to endure, but I really like the way Sinbad gets out of it. See, he was allowed to eat and drink, so he made himself some alcohol out of fermented fruit and got fucking wasted. The old man got curious, so he drank some booze as well, and after he got trashed, his grip started to loosen, so Sinbad just tossed his ass. Determined to make sure he doesn't end up the old man's slave ever again though, he had to finish the job, and his choice method of execution was smashing his old master's head with a small boulder. Then you can probably guess what happens next because it's how almost every voyage in this collection ends. Sinbad is picked up by a passing ship, they make some stops at other islands, one of which has the unique quality of being overrun by apes every single night, then finally he sails back home. Now I hate to say it, but this next voyage is pretty lame and tame in comparison to the others we've talked about, so I'll give you the too long didn't read version. Sinbad and company are stranded after their boat is smashed on the cliffs, and they wind up on an island with no food whatsoever. But the river flows with ambrosia, the drink of the Greek gods by the way, and diamonds and pearls can be found lining the island's valleys and shores. Imagine how torturous that would be for, of all people, a group of merchants. The island has everything they need for lifelong wealth back home, but it doesn't have any food or water, so they're probably going to die before they can take advantage. And by probably, I mean definitely. Over the next few weeks, all of Sinbad's mates die, so he says, bump this, I'm not going out like a chump, and builds himself a raft to follow a river to see if it leads to civilization. Long story short, it does. Sinbad becomes BFFs with the island society's king, just like he does with every other king he meets, and he chills out for a while before eventually deciding he wants to go back home. The king of the island then hooks him up with some gifts for his king back home, as well as a ride back to Baghdad, and the voyage ends after Sinbad makes the exchange. And now we're on to Sinbad's seventh and final voyage. Once more, our hero gets bored with his cushy life in Baghdad and yearns for adventure, but after being attacked by three Gyarados-like sea monsters, the wind takes his ship and smashes it on the rocks. Sinbad survived by grabbing hold of a floating plank, and he washed up on another island where he's welcomed into the city of merchants. Not only that, but he starts working for the chief of merchants who figured if this guy survived an attack from multiple Gyaradoses, he must be special and soon gains his trust. Then, after a few months go by, the chief asks Sinbad to marry his daughter, he agrees, the chief conveniently dies soon after the wedding, and Sinbad inherits all of his wealth. Soon after this, Sinbad also learns a strange secret about the city of merchants. Apparently on the first of every month, its citizens, not including his wife and her father, anamorph into birds. We're never told why it happens or what purpose it serves, but after learning about it, Sinbad asks one of the citizens to carry him while he flies. They do just that, but the ride doesn't go as planned. They end up flying a little too close to the heavens, so much so that Sinbad can hear angels singing, but suddenly fire 
fire rains down from the sky and he crash lands on a mountain. He wanders the mountainside for a while, finds the fellow who carried him into the sky and convinces him to bring him back to the city of merchants, after promising he won't make him fly so high this time. After he returns, Sinbad easily convinces his wife to come with him back to Baghdad, where his friends and family are overjoyed to find that he survived his adventures once again, then he swears to never go on another voyage for the rest of his life. Okay, so there is actually one more voyage, but this one's a quickie and it actually isn't Sinbad's eighth adventure, but rather an alternate seventh one that can be found in some renditions. In this version, Sinbad actually doesn't want to do any more traveling, but the Khalifi, or chief Muslim, orders him to bring gifts to a nearby king. Sinbad reluctantly does so and, get this, on his journey back, he ends up being captured and sold into slavery where he's forced to hunt elephants with bows and arrows. After dealing with his people being murdered for so long, the king of the elephants actually develops a personal vendetta against the hunters and grabs hold of Sinbad, then carries him to the elephant graveyard. You would think this would be where Sinbad dies or is maybe confronted by some ethereal elephant deity, but instead the king elephant just abandons him. The sailor turned slave then wanders back to his master's place and tells him about what happened, as well as how much precious ivory there is to be found in the elephant graveyard. His master is so overjoyed at the news that he sets Sinbad free, and our hero returns home with stacks of ivory and gold, making him richer than ever before. Now, depending on what version of Sinbad's story you read, it might end right there, with him returning home and committing to his life of luxury. In others, we return to the frame story. Sinbad's sailor gives Sinbad Porter one last extravagant gift and then sends him on his way. But in Richard Burton's translation, the sailor actually has some wise words for the porter, basically telling him, so, as you can see, this wasn't all given to me. I had to go through some shit. Consider, therefore, O Sinbad, O landsman, what sufferings I've undergone and what perils and hardships I've endured before coming to my present state. Then Sinbad Porter leaves Sinbad Sailor's palace feeling grateful for the lessons he was just taught, and I like to imagine he went from there right to the docks to jump on a ship and experience an adventure for himself. So as you may have gathered by now, the seven voyages of Sinbad share some qualities with the hero's journey archetype that we discussed in my video about the Little Mermaid. Sinbad leaves the home he's known all his life to venture to foreign lands and make a name for himself instead of just riding on his father's coattails. Things obviously don't go smoothly, not even in the slightest bit, but he does end up both wiser and richer from the experience. The same can be said about an even older tale that some experts believe played a role in influencing Sinbad, the tale of the shipwrecked sailor, which comes from ancient Egypt and was found written on papyrus. As you can hopefully guess, the story also follows a sailor who shipwrecked on a mysterious island, only this time that island is inhabited by some kind of giant snake deity which confers wisdom onto the sailor, including the fact that he should always be brave and take care of his family, and after a few months, the sailor is rescued. Now, some say that Sinbad isn't quite hero material, being that on the surface, his only goal seems to be to gain his wealth back, but I totally disagree with that statement. Even though he's not the greatest guy by today's standards, even from the very start, it's evident to me that Sinbad is overcome by an urge that's far deeper than I want to be rich again. Every single voyage starts with Sinbad living in complete comfort, only to be struck by the desire for new experiences. And the fact that he almost dies every single time he steps on a boat doesn't deter him, it's what makes it more exciting. And I think what might be my favorite part is that every time he's in the company of his friends, he says he forgot immediately about the suffering he endured on his travels, which I think is an interesting commentary about the human psyche. I, for one, certainly experience this phenomenon every week with these videos. It's not always easy or fun to sit in front of a computer for 10 hours a day, stuffing my brain with information, just to vomit it back out at the camera, and then spend another 20 hours in front of the computer editing it. But when it's all finally over, I honestly get giddy to start the whole process over over again. Sure, maybe it's a little masochistic, but it's also fulfilling, like when you force yourself out of your comfort zone and use your one life to experience the world like Sinbad did. And that actually reminds me, do you know what would have made Sinbad's voyages a lot less miserable if he knew about this week's sponsor, Raycon? Now, I don't know about you, but if I were to go on a voyage like Sinbad, I would not want to be without the essentials, food, water, hair gel, and earbuds. Because between all of that aimless wandering and biding time until a rescue party shows up, I just know I would be bored as hell if I didn't have something to listen to. And if I'm going on an adventure, there's a particular set of earbuds I'm going to pack, my Raycon Everyday E25s. And that's not just because Raycon is a company that's known for making high quality, durable headphones and earbuds that are only half the price of competing brands, but it's also because of how much I love using their products. The Bluetooth connectivity is instantaneous, they have more bass and a noise isolating fit to help you focus on the task at hand. And if you do find yourself stranded on an island like Sinbad, don't worry, because the earbuds have six whole hours of playtime and their case can store four entire charges. And the cherry on top is the Everyday E25s come in a multitude of colors, so you can choose the one that matches your style best. Yeah, all of those features, and they still cost half the price of competing brands.
Why don't you already own a pair? Well, if you want to change that and join me in owning some of the most reliable, comfortable, and affordable wireless earbuds on the market, just go to buyraycon.com solo or follow my link in the description to get an extra 15% off your order. How smooth was that transition? Anyway, solo fam, as much of a disorganized mess as that analysis was, I hope you got a little something out of it and enjoyed today's story about Sinbad. If that was the case, make sure you let me know by hitting that like button, consider subscribing if you want more content like this delivered to your sub box every week, and share this video with anyone you know who might like it. When you're through with that, don't forget to comment your thoughts on today's story, whether that's your own analysis of the archetypes or which voyage you think would be the most miserable. That's totally up to you. And of course, find me on social media to stay updated on Messed Up Origins news, send a suggestion my way, or just send me some spicy memes. Make sure to follow my son and our channel mascot Gunther too, because why wouldn't you? Do you not have a soul? I'll be back next week with a very special Mother's Day themed episode of Messed Up Origins, which I am very excited about because it's one I've been wanting to make for years now. Until that day comes, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.